Thanks for joining us in Bloomberg Quaint. I have with me Neil Earl, Senior Vice President of Hyperloop India. Hyperloop One. Uh, thank you, Neil, for your time. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, sure. Karnataka became the third state where you find a member of an understanding That's right. for, to start the feasibility study That's right. uh, in India. Yes. Uh, tell us about you know how much time will it take for the feasibility study now and what's more in the pipeline? Right, exactly. So we've um, actually in the last uh, 24 hours announced that we've got three feasibility studies going in India. So just to recap, Andhra Pradesh, which was the first one. Maharashtra. I, I uh, signed that with the Chief Minister um, last night, very late last night, and then this morning came down here to Bangalore and we've just signed the agreement here. Virgin Hyperloop One is the only company in the world that's mm -hmm. built a Hyperloop. Now what that means is we know a lot about it, we know a lot about its cost, its capabilities. Now what we really want to do is find out what, what are the best routes in the world. Now we've always thought that India mm -hmm. would have the best routes, not because of the high-tech industry that's here, although that's important, but because obviously the one big advantage is ridership. Right. I mean, a good route has a lot of ridership, which makes it profitable for private investors to come in, which sure. subsidizes it. So what we're doing in each of these studies is we're analyzing about five or six possible routes per study. And the intent after six weeks is to come up with the one that has the best business case that delivers a few things. One is the most business value. So, for instance, in uh, Bangalore, it could be from here to Chennai in 23 minutes. That mm -hmm. delivers a lot of value, freight and people. Right. But also, it would actually create the best ecosystem to attract private investment uh, because people say, wow, that could be a really profitable route. And that will then lower the cost of, of it, which makes it easier for governments to go ahead. So that's what we're trying to do. Right. And uh, you've already done a feasibility study in... Uh Two other states. So you've done in. Uh, you no, know, we've one done one in. We just uh, completed the one in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we can't. Say, we 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 submitted it, but we can't say what the results were. But there is one route that that, mm -hmm. that looks very good. And by the way, we've done about fourteen other studies around the world. How realistic is this technology? Because all you have seen is test of smaller duration. Yeah. There's no yeah. actual test with human being inside. I guess. Uh, no. Well. No, there hasn't. I, I was just about to contradict you until you said the very last thing. So let's just lay it out there. First of all, you're absolutely right. Look, I'm an IT guy uh, for, for 30 years in IT. Whenever anything truly revolutionary came in IT, the first thing that happened is lots of companies formed. Right. That's the nature of the venture capital business. So, so it's a good thing because people think something big is here. But then the thing that distinguishes us from other companies, and you know, it's, it's a lot of confusion. There's companies, they... Uh, they have Hyperloop in their name, some right. companies don't have Hyperloop in their name. We're different for, for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One is we've raised $250 million, which is about, we think, eight to ten times more than anybody else. Right. Uh, uh, and by the way, we're just about to finish our next big raise, okay. so more on that to come. But the real reason we're different is that we're the only company in the world that's built. The last bit that you mentioned was there's no humans. Right. The reason there's no humans is you need a safety certificate to put mm -hmm. a human in. Okay, so where we are in our technology development is we built one, mm -hmm. we proved it works. That's caused huge interest. Three studies, for example, in India. Now what we need to do is is get a, um, a contract to start uh, building one commercially on the ground. Mm -hmm. The reason is you, the, the safety certificate has to be issued by the regulator locally. Right. So what happens is when you build one on, say, an initial 20 or 30 kilometer route, you work with the regulator, the local regulator, mm -hmm. they issue a safety certificate. Sorry. At this point, you can then sell tickets mm -hmm. and the public can, um, can ride. If the government approves it, the feasibility study, how soon we can have? Yeah. So the, the, what, ten, what happens is uh, the, it, the feasibility study gets submitted and then people say, okay, wow, this one looks, this route looks Something. good. So then we do a more detailed study. Let's right. really go into it to actually narrow it down. Mm -hmm. And then we'll work with a, an engineering company. We need to look at the terrain. Mm -hmm. Where do we need to tunnel? The exact costs. We need to talk to manufacturers, get their costs. So that can take another six months. At the end of that, we could be in a position to say, okay, let's build a short section of the track mm -hmm. to get the regulator mm -hmm. involved. Regulator then, we then have to build it, we have to run the pods, mm -hmm. we have to do what's called switching, so right. you can go from one tube to the other, um, and um, then the regulator has to issue the certificate. And then you can open, open for business, sell tickets. Mm -hmm. So if you take all that and think, what is the best we can do. If we can work with a forward-thinking government mm -hmm. where a regulator wants to work with us, 
uh, in a collaborative manner. We think that by 2022 or 2023, mm -hmm. we could have full commercial operations. So how much money are you looking to invest in India? We did some work that said, look, let's assume that, that um, over time, India, let's say in 10 years' time, India has 2,000 kilometers of high track, yeah. which is, in a country the size of India, is possible. Mm -hmm. You start linking these things together, 2,000 kilometers is, is not a lot. You then look at what jobs would be needed mm -hmm. for that, mm -hmm. and the answer is huge. There's three types of jobs. There's investment, direct investment by us. Mm -hmm. um, we would uh, also, we'd start recruiting people from universities. Then there's the supply chain, all the component providers, uh, raw materials, uh, building the pods, the vehicles, they're like jet, jet aircraft. Mm -hmm. That's all gonna be done by local companies. We're not gonna do that. We'll license the technology, mm -hmm. but we're not gonna build it. It's not like high-speed rail where the, the trains are made outside India. Uh, the carriages are made outside India and they come in. Uh, we, we actually will manufacture everything locally. Mm -hmm. And the third type of job is what we call ecosystem job. Remember, the, the, the Hyperloop actually has an operating system. So there's, uh, people don't realize this. It's like the iPhone. There's an application platform. You'll be able to have personalized apps during your journey. Right. It's like iOS on the iPhone. So, so if we take all three types of jobs, there could be, over time, um, with that sort of uh, length of, uh, of, of Hyperloop, national network, we could be talking about 20 to 30,000 jobs in the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that is a direct contributor to the Indian economy, right. as well as the productivity from getting people and freight uh, uh, from A to B much, much quicker. Right. And you mentioned also, briefly mentioned about the new fund that you're looking to raise. Yes. Can you give us sort of a snapshot, who are the investors, how much roughly amount you're looking to raise in the, uh, the next round as well? Uh, I the areas you're going to use? Yeah, I, I obviously, it, well, what I can tell you is it's called the Series C. So yeah. we, we announced recently we closed the B1. B1. The B1 was at $85 million, of mm -hmm. which uh, Branson was one of the investors mm -hmm. in the B1. Uh, we've set our goal at, at uh, raising um, uh, more than that mm -hmm. in the Series C. So we hope it's quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. more than that, and that's as much as I can say. Our CFO, who was the CFO at Uber, mm -hmm. by the way, raised four billion at Uber. So he's raised more money in venture capital than anybody else. Right. He's now our CFO, mm -hmm. and he is doing meetings nonstop every day with investors, and we hope to uh, be able to close the Series C over the next few weeks. Right, and the test that you're doing of the capsule, how much... Uh people can accommodate that capsule? We're building the capsule, um, the capsules that will, uh, uh, we think the optimum size um, is about 50, and let me explain why that is. There's multiple reasons. There's, there's weight, because you don't want it too heavy, because mm -hmm. you've got to lift mm -hmm. it. But the main driver is actually the passengers per hour. Mm -hmm. If you need about 15, 16,000 passengers per hour in each direction, mm -hmm. then you, you, and if the pods leave about every 20 seconds, mm -hmm. mathematics works out that you mm -hmm. need about 50, 50 people per pod. So we think 50 is about the right size, but frankly, you could make a Hyperloop pod that had four people in it. Okay. Uh, but we think the, the for, for routes within India, a 50 person pod leaving about every 20 seconds would be a pretty good deal. Two quick questions. I want to understand how far are we away from you know having the first human test run of Hyperloop? I would imagine the first human would probably be 2021 20, to 2022, so it's about a year before full commercial operation. And if you had to set up a Hyperloop in India, how much expensive or cheaper would it be? Okay, so the, everybody, and you'd finish with the cost question. <laughs> so, not only does it collapse time and distance, the so 23 minutes uh, to Chennai, but when we compare it, the routes, to high speed rail, because that's the really thing, mm. and you look at the total lifetime costs, we're two thirds of the cost of high speed rail. People right. say, why? The reason is, is that we take we don't have to buy as much land and secondly when you um, when you uh, when the hyperloop moves as soon as it's moving because of the vacuum we turn power off mm -hmm. glides like a spaceship so on a route like um, for example Bangalore to Chennai we'd only use electricity for 10% okay if you put solar panels on you could generate electricity think of that right. think of it generating electricity from a transport system no with with with, with no carbon uh, pollution or anything. So the, what you get is the operating cost. There's no friction. Operating costs, maintenance costs, very low. Construction costs, lower. Net effect, about two-thirds of the cost of high-speed rail, but three to four times faster mm -hmm. because every journey is direct to destination. Right. High-speed rail stops at every station. So this is, this is like internet packet switching. Right. So 
it's very compelling and people say okay if you can prove it mm -hmm. then this is truly radical so that's the stage we're at having built one now we want to prove it locally right, right. it's a pleasure being with you and you uh, thank you so much for your time yeah you're welcome nice to speak to you cheers